On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nana Pokyo, it is a pleasure, great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Rutipano Goswami. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Goswami. The Registrar, Dr. Kathy Cleland, extends her sincere apology for not joining us today. The Registrar conveys her congratulations and warm wishes to Professor Goswami. Inaugural lecture form part of the University Public Lecture Series and may only be presented by newly appointed professors who have been appointed in an academic school and centers. Inaugural lecture presents an opportunity of showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. And these lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity to new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contributions to their field, to academic peers, students, research collaborators. In a grand lecture, are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievement with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like also to acknowledge the following guests, the members of executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurants this afternoon, Professor Kosani, family and friends of Professor Kosani, academics, professional staff and students and alumni. A special welcome to our guests from universities and organizations within South Africa, the Africa continent and across the globe. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean and Head of Schools of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science, Professor Serestina Ferreri, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Gosani. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Mdau, the Registrar and Personnel from the Registrar's Office, the Director of Corporate Relations and Personnel from the, the Director of uh, Corporate Relations, Professor Kosomi and your family present here online and, and uh, physically, Professor Kosomi's friends, staff from the School of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science, and the staff from the university, staff from the college, and all invited guests. Professor Kosomi is a full professor and academic leader research in the School of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Professor Gosami received a BSc Honours Degree in Physics and an MSc Degree in Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Karagupa in India. He received a PhD Degree in Gravitational Physics from the Tata Institute of Foundational Research in Mumbai, India. Thereafter, he obtained his postdoctoral training from the University of Alberta in Canada and from the University of Cape Town, that is between 2006 and 2012. Since the onset of his research career in 2002, Professor Goswami has been continuously conducting frontier research in the field of astrophysics, gravitation and cosmology. To date, he has published 77 peer-reviewed articles in high-impact international journals with a total citation of 2,271 and an H index of 25. Based on his research career, Professor Goswami has been rated as a C1 researcher by the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Further to this, in year two, 2022, that is last year, he was inaugurated as a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Since 2017, Professor Gosami has been working as the chairperson 
of the Academic Subcommittee of the National Astrophysics and Space Science Program. He is the national coordinator of the South African Mathematics Team Competition since 2017, 2018. Further to this, he is the University of KwaZulu-Natal node leader for the following three organizations, the University Capacity Development Program, National Collaborative Project, is also the node leader for the National Graduate Academy for Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, and is also a node leader for the Center of Excellence Mathematical and Statistical Sciences. Professor Gosami has been actively involved in various scientific advancement activities, like the organization of Inter-Provincial Mathematics Olympiad in South Africa, by setting problems, assisting students, and organizing workshops. He is the organizer of the weekly seminar series and popular talks within the school. He always participates and makes presentations in all outreach programs of the school and the university. I invite Professor Goswami to deliver his inaugural lecture. Thank you, Professor Modau, Professor Viridi, and everybody listening to this talk. In fact, according to the definition, it's widely accepted that the inaugural lectures are sort of a rite of passage to become the part of the professoriate, but somehow today for me, more than the rite of passage, it is a day of gratitude. A day to be grateful and thankful for the enormous amount of non-ending love I have received from everybody around me that saw me through this day. As Khalil Gibran very nicely put it, to return home at eventide with gratitude and then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise upon your lips. On the same note, my deepest love to these persons, among them, apart from my mom, who is possibly listening to this talk far away from India, the rest have silently walked away towards sunset and perhaps only the silent most prayers can reach them now. Anyway, coming to the matters of gravity. As we all know, the mathematical principles for the theory of gravitation was first published in the year 1687 and the author used to stay in this house. This house is called Woolsthorpe Manor. It's in a village called Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire, England. You can see an apple tree in front of the house and as the folklore goes, the author was sitting under a similar apple tree and an apple fell on his head and then he realized there was gravity. Remember, it's just a folklore, but still it's quite fortunate that the author was in England and not in some tropical islands like Mauritius or Seychelles. Uh, otherwise, it could have been a big disaster. Right. So as I said, in the year 1687, he published his uh, monograph, Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica. This monograph had three parts. The first two parts were called de motu corporum, that means on the motion of bodies. And the third part was called de mundi systemate, that means on the systems of the world. So in this third part, de mundi systemate, in proposition seven, he presented his famous law of gravitation. As you can see in a sort of very unceremonious way, 
It was just like any other proposition in the book. But the interesting part is th these set of words in this proposition tending to all bodies. Now, this is very interesting because just before this proposition, if you read the book, he was talking about Earth Moon system and Sun Jupiter system, and he was trying to match some data available at that time with his calculations, but all with specific systems. But suddenly in this proposition seven, he says, tending to all bodies. That means gravity is universal. It's the same reason that the apple is falling on the earth as the earth is going around the sun or moon is going around the earth and so on and so forth. And needless to say that this theory of gravity was perhaps the most successful theory for the next 200 years. And even now at the scale of earth, it's still quite a successful theory. Now, as we were increasing the scale, then there were small discrepancies creeping in, which perhaps cannot be uh, explained by the theory. For example, the perihelion of Mercury. With every rotation of Mercury around the sun, the perihelion shifts a little bit, though a little bit, but still it shifts. And unfortunately, by the Newton's theory, this cannot be explained. Also, just like any other classical theory of gravity, uh, I mean, any other classical theory rather, this theory was non-relativistic. For example, if you have two masses, say M1 and M2, everybody knows from the high school that the force between them is given by G M1 times M2 by R square. That's the Newton's law of gravitation. Now, suppose by some magic, you make one of the mass vanish. Now, instantaneously, the force between them will vanish. But we know in the reality, there is no instantaneous transfer of interaction. The interactions always transfer via a finite speed and the maximum speed is the velocity of light in vacuum. So this theory being non-relativistic was a problem and it took around 10 years for Einstein after he published his theory of special relativity to come up to a relativistic theory of gravity, which is the general theory of relativity. Now in this theory, via two more principles, one is called the principle of general covariance. This is what he wrote in his paper in German, by the way, which translates to the general laws of nature are to be expressed by equations, which holds good for all system of coordinates that are covariant with respect to any substitutions, whatever. So that, that is straight from his paper. This is the principle of general covariance. And then there is the principle of equivalence in which he says that no experiment can actually differentiate between the effects of gravity and the effects of acceleration of a frame. So these two principles actually took the universality of gravity to an absolutely different level altogether. And then you can see that the space time, which is four dimensional, three dimensional space as we see it and one dimensional time that makes it four dimensional space time and matter being very intimately related. So action of space-time on matter determines the motion of the matter, whereas the action of matter on the space-time determines the geometry. So in other words, presence of matter curves the geometry and this curvature tells the matter how to move. So this whole thing can be very nicely pictorially explained in the following way. By the way, in this talk, when I say the word tensor, and if you don't know what tensor is, please don't get afraid. Just remember that tensors are set of numbers. It's not a one number, but a set of numbers that obey some algebraic and differential properties, that's all. 
So it turns out in the four dimensional space time, at every point you need exactly 20 numbers to define its geometry completely. So these 20 numbers are called Riemann curvature tensor, denoted by R, A, B, C, D, don't bother about this, but just remember these are 20 numbers. Now the prop, by the property of these 20 numbers, they can be subdivided into a groups of 10 numbers. The first group is called Ricci tensor and denoted by R, A, B. And the next group is called Weyl tensor and denoted by C, A, B, C, D. Now what Einstein did was very interesting. By his famous equation, G, A, B equals T, A, B, he actually related this first 10 numbers, which is the Ricci tensor, with another set of 10 numbers that denotes the energy, pressure, and momentum of matter. So in this way, you see matter and geometry became inti uh, very intimately related. Now the next question is, so does these numbers evolve independently? The answer is no. There is a very interesting geometrical identity called Bianchi identity that actually governs the evolution of these 20 numbers in space and time. So that's all about this theory. If I just, uh, I explained it in a perfect pictorial way. Perhaps this is one of the most beautiful theory till now our civilization has ever produced. Even Einstein wrote in his memoirs that at any given moment out of all conceivable constructions, a single one has already always proved itself absolutely superior to all the rest. So even he deemed this theory as the superior most theory among all the rest. And it's a beautiful geometrical theory. And as you know, perhaps it's a law of the nature that with every beauty comes a lot of mysteries, deep mysteries. And it's actually these mysteries that attracted me to perform research in this field. So of course, looking at my gray hair, you can imagine that I am not a millennium baby at all, but my research career is definitely, I started my research exactly in the year 2000. And let me confess one thing here, that throughout my research career, I have been extremely, extremely fortunate because I have always been working with giants in the field. My PhD supervisor, Pankaj Joshi, George Ellis, Naresh Tadhich, Louis Wheaton, Roy Martins, Valerie Frolov, Peter Dunsby, then Sunil, Dams and Pubal. All of them are giants. Now, one good point of working with giants is perhaps if you look innocent enough and helpless enough, then they can actually put you on their shoulders so you can look far. Until now in my research career, whatever I have achieved and whatever I have seen, I entirely owe everything to them. And I believe words are not enough to express my gratitude towards them. So thank you all. Okay, so now let me tell you briefly some of these mysteries re that's related with gravity that I've been working on for the past 23 years. The first of them is what happens when a massive star dies? So we know that stars are always burning the nuclear fuels. And when this nuclear fuel gets exhausted and the stars are really massive, then what actually happens after that? And this question was bugging people from a long time. In fact, in the year 1932, Lev Landau wrote that for masses greater than a critical mass, there exists in the whole quantum theory no cause from preventing the system collapsing to a point. By the way, Landau was just 24 years there. The average is age of our masters or honor student, but this shows how strong a statement he could make. 
He was Lev Landau anyway. And just after two years, Chandrasekhar made a more cautious statement like this, that a star of large mass cannot pass into the white dwarf stage and one is left speculating on other possibilities. Then via the Raichaudhuri equations, etc., Roger Penrose gave his famous idea of trapped surfaces. So what are these trapped surfaces? He sh showed that if you put a lot of mass within a closed volume, then the gravity becomes so much that nothing, even light, cannot escape there. So in that case, that space-time region becomes trapped and whatever is happening there, since even light cannot escape, nobody from the exterior would, know, able, would be able to know what's happening inside. For example, you cannot take your cell phone inside and say, oh, this is happening here because your cell phone signal won't come out. So you can visualize that as a vortex in a whirlpool. And what Penrose showed in his famous singularity theorems for which he got the Nobel Prize a couple of years back, that if this trapped surface exists and the energy theorems are satisfied, that means the energy and momenta, they are all positive. I mean, energy and pressure, etc. In that case, this whole thing collapsing to a point is inevitable. Singularities are inevitable in a wide range of gravity, uh, theories of gravity, not only general theory of relativity. So this is what he actually drew. This is from the Penrose's drawing. By the way, he's a brilliant artist, by the way. So this is what exactly he drew. So the upper axis shows the time evolution. So a big star, when it's collapsing and collapsing to this point, which is the singularity, as he says, it is inevitable. But even before the star reaches the singularity, there is a circle in, the, in between where the whole star becomes trapped and invisible to any external observer. Now, this is quite heartbreaking, isn't it? Because just imagine the scenario, a whole star, say five or six times the solar mass, is actually shrinking to a point and the observers outside would sit just imagining what would happen then. And suddenly the whole thing becomes trapped. That means the, as if the nature closes the door in front of you rudely saying, no, this is for adults only. Maybe something like this. And this is definitely not fair. But now the question is that are we really sure that this is exactly the complete scenario. Like knowing the extent the children can go, are we really sure that something like this is not happening? The answer is maybe not, we are not sure because after a wide range of calculations of different models, we distinctly see that there are two scenarios possible. The scenario in the right-hand side is what Penrose drew, that this trapping forms much early, earlier than the central singularity. However, in many cases, it is seen that although the trapping forms, they don't form early enough to entirely shield the singularity. So in that case, the external observer would be able to see what is happening very near the singularity. And that's exciting enough. Now the question is, what is the mechanism that differentiate between these two? Now through our research, what we could definitely show that we talked about this 10 numbers in Riemann curvature, which is called the Weyl curvature. Now, if you, if you try to understand physically what these 10 numbers that is denoted by Weyl curvature do, they are actually responsible for tidal deformations, the tidal forces. Now, this tidal deformation generates shear or deformation in the space-time, 
And that is, this shear is actually what delays the formation of this trapped region. So we can, in principle, go very near the singularity and look at its effect. Now, this is all theoretical, by the way, but still it's very interesting. And the quest continues. For example, the quest about what would be the observational signature in these cases, we know we can see many very high energy phenomena in the sky, but which, one, which of them are related to these cases? That's absolutely an open question. And the second open question is, we all know there is a very well-developed theory of black hole dynamics and thermodynamics. Now, the interesting point is, Many proofs of the theorems in black hole thermodynamics is strictly based on the fact that thou shall not see the singularity. Now, if that breaks down, the theorems may still be right, but we need to reformulate the proof. And that's a big open question remaining so far. Okay, another open question which bothers, which is bothering uh, physicists for till now is what is the energy associated with gravity? So we know that what is energy associated with other fields, say energy associated with electromagnetic fields and uh, other fields in nature. But the difference, as I said, between gravity and the other fields is the other fields reside on space time. But gravity is space-time itself. It's the geometry of the space-time. Then, of course, somebody can say that, okay, fine, since gravity is the geometry of the space-time, and just now you said that those 20 numbers, which are called Riemann curvature tensor, exactly determines the geometry of the space-time completely, then why can't we define something which is, looks like energy from these 20 numbers? It's a good enough suggestion, I agree. But there is a caveat in there. And what is the caveat? The caveat is as just now I showed you in picture that these 20 numbers actually incorporates the whole matter energy itself. So if you try to convert this Riemann tensor to energy, then you are double counting matter energy. So then people will say, okay, then fine. The matter is related to the Ricci part of the 10 numbers. That's true. What about the wild part? So you can construct the energy of gravity from the wild part. Very nice idea, but it's much easier said than done. Till now, we don't have any real uh, universal prescription to define energy of the field from the wild part. However, the interesting part is from the wild part, you can form another 10 numbers, which are called Bell-Robinson tensor. By the way, Robinson actually introduced this tensor in one of his classes in Imperial College London. He never even wrote a paper about it. He just, he was teaching GR and he came in and introduced this tensor. So this Bell-Robinson is another 10 numbers that sort of behaves like square of energy, square of momentum kind of a thing. Then one should say, oh, that's fine. Then just take the square root and you will get the energy and momentum. But remember, as I said, tensors are not one number, they're a set of numbers. So to find the square root of a set of numbers is, which obeys the same algebraic and differential structure is a very non-trivial problem. And interestingly, what we found out was up to an arbitrary part for space times that are Coulomb like, which is that means there is a central force, and uh, space times which is like this, or exactly wave like, you can actually take a square root of that tensor. In that case, in that case what happens is we get a very interesting conservation loss. The first one is the conservation of energy and momentum, which is uh, a universal conservation law you get straight from the Bianchi identities. 
And the second one is a conservation law, which gives the interplay between this free gravity, which is the square root of that bell Robinson thing I talked about, and some interaction tensor, which is made up of matter variable. So it's a very nice interplay between uh, matter and gravity as seen from this second equation. However, as I said, the quest continues because we are nowhere near a universal description of the energy of gravity. This is for a very specific type of space times and nothing we cannot say like uh, proposition seven, this is for all space times. So the quest obviously continues. Now, another very interesting problem is what are near field effects of gravitational waves? Now, we all know that the gravitational waves are disturbances on the space time fabric that travels with the speed of light. And interestingly, gravitational waves have no Newtonian counterpart. There cannot be any gravitational waves in Newtonian gravity. So very fact that gravitational wave exists implies that the gravity is not Newtonian. So this is a schematic diagram of say two black holes uh, circling around each other and how that generates a wave on the fabric of space and time four dimensional space and time that travels with the speed of light. Now, perhaps all of you know that uh, we have built very big detectors, like this is the LIGO detector that uh, detected gravitational waves from black hole mergers and black hole neutron star mergers for the last couple of years. They have detected quite a few events. It's a huge, huge, huge detector. As you can see, each uh, length is around four kilometers or 2.5 miles long. However, what we are actually detecting, if you see, we are detecting gravitational radiation. Now, what is the difference between gravitational waves and gravitational radiation? One can very well uh, understand it from the bow waves of a boat. Now, you see, far away from the boat, the water ripples are very nice, nicely like a sinusoidal ripples they pass through. That is the radiation zone. And that is exactly what we are detecting via LIGO and et cetera. Now, if someone asks you, okay, that is far away from the boat, what happens near the boat engine? It is definitely a wave, but it's nearly impossible to mathematically model such a wave. It's, it's so dangerous. So these are the near field effect. Now, people who works with antennas, they know, that far away electromagnetic fields are so nice. They are just nice sinusoidal waves. But when you come near an antenna, near your TV antenna, things get haywire. Sometimes electric field is a lot more than magnetic field and so on and so forth. So although it's still gravitational waves, what are the near field effects? What we found out was very interesting. The tidal forces, are one of the near field effects of gravitational waves. So this is exactly what we proposed, that the tidal forces experienced by the bodies in a binary system are very slow time varying. What do we mean by very slow time varying is given by the time scale of rotation, time varying gravitational waves of small multiple moments with large electric part of oil, don't uh, bother about if you don't understand. Like this wild tensor, just like electromagnetic magnetic tensor has its electric field and magnetic field. So the wild tensor also has its electric part and magnetic part with a large electric part of wild and small magnetic part of wild, but both with a non-vanishing curve. So this is the mathematical proposition we actually proposed. Now, this is very interesting because we build so big detectors spending lots of money. Of course, it's required to do measurements on gravitational waves. But if we just want a proof of existence that gravitational waves do exist, 
then it was right in front of our eyes so far, but we actually did not see it. Another question, and of course this quest continues, that what are other near field effects of the gravitational waves and how we can merge them all together into a sim simple picture like this, that gravitational radiation and gravitational waves are, are, are and tidal forces are two extremities of gravitational waves. Right. Now there is another very important question that is bothering the scientists all around the world that do we need to modify general relativity? Now, philosophically, this question do, of course, do make sense because for 200 years, Newtonian gravity was the gravity, but slowly we saw the need for modification and then came general relativity by Einstein. And if we see that if we go on a larger and larger scales and there are deflections from this theory, then definitely we would think that this is a special case of some bigger picture. And also this questions, this question is quite, becomes quite relevant when we look at the energy budget of our entire universe. So although we claim that uh, we understand our universe quite well, it turns out that the visible universe, what we actually see is only 5%. And what we don't see is 95%. And they are all in a quote unquote dark sector. So around 26% dark matter and 68% dark energy. Dark matter is something which only interacts with other matter via gravity and nothing else. And dark energy is something what we don't know actually. All we know is it has something with negative pressure. So it's actually pushing the universe apart. The universe is expanding with an acceleration and that is only possible if there is something called dark energy. Now one can say that, okay, why do we need a matter with dark energy? A cosmological constant lambda will do the job. It is true, definitely, on the classical level that it will do the job. But the problem comes when you try to incorporate quantum field theory into cosmology. There, there is always this puzzle that if supersymmetry is so badly broken, then why the value of cosmological constant is so small? So then, of course, the question arises that is this a sort of epicycle effect that Copernicus faced? That possibly GR is not the theory of gravity. It is a subsection of a bigger picture. And when you take into account that bigger theory of gravity, all these dark sectors automatically vanish. Now, it's a very good question to ask, definitely. But interestingly, what has happened is, especially the way the current research is going, by asking this question, we have actually opened the Pandora's box. Now, every day morning when I open the archives to see what new researches have come out, invariably some new theory will come out. Theories with demons, phantoms, ghosts. Seriously, sometimes I feel like I'm reading uh, Marvel comics rather than a research paper. Theories which has no relation with actual physical reality and even some theories which doesn't have mathematical rigor. So it's just coming out every other day. And if this continues, I'm sure like, um, with his expertise on machine learning and artificial intelligence, Professor Biriri will very soon make a theory bot that will make a new theory every day, make some graphs, write a paper and submit it to the journal. So we don't need researchers working on it anymore. So possibly perhaps, I feel at least that we have lost the plot here. 
So as Einstein said that any, any given moment out of all conceivable constructions, uh, a single one uh, proving superior to all, we haven't reached anywhere near it. So what to do and what to look for? I guess we must need to go back to the master once again. Now in his third edition of Principia, because people were asking questions now that how exactly he formulated the theory. In the same book, De Mundi Systemate, Newton added these rules of reasoning in philosophy. These are excellent rules and every scientist or every philosopher must know these rules. So among this rule four says, in experimental philosophy, we are to look upon propositions collected by general inductions from phenomena as accurately or very nearly true. And nothing should be imagined. For example, we cannot make a theory that, okay, it, uh, I mean, I can explain X, Y, and Z, but this theory has a problem when there is nobody looking, fairies, as, fairies are coming into this room and dancing. That should not be a theory because a theory should only be based upon what can be experimentally verified. So I think we need to look, at, look into this from the perspective of Newton and with these rules of reasoning in philosophy. We can make any number of theories possible, but at the end of the day, if that theory cannot reproduce the acceleration due to gravity of a falling apple being 9.8 meter per second square, or shift in perihelion of mercury or bending of light, which are very well tested experimentally, then however good that theory looks like, we must throw them in the, in the dustbin. Right. So I started my talk with the reminiscence of the past. So let me speak something about the future. As I said, I am very blessed in my research career because I always worked with giants. The same goes true for my supervision career. Throughout my life as a supervisor, I have got this excellent, very hardworking, brilliant students. And uh, I'm really proud of them all. And what's more uh, rewarding is that many of them have decided to continue in academia, making the academia even richer. So of course I can very strongly say that the future is bright. Although you can see that uh, they carry guitar or Yoda or crocodiles, <laughs> but still I would say they're amazing. And of course, nothing could have been possible without the comradeships of all these ladies in my life. So a strong red salute to all of them. And of course, all these children from whom I'm learning the meaning of life every moment. So thanks a lot to all of them. Now it is perhaps true that poets can visualize truth much earlier than anybody else. Because till now I haven't read a more apt description of our universe with quantum fluctuations rather than this poem by Tego. Now it's very interesting that Einstein used to revere Tagore a lot. And he always, in his correspondence to Tagore, he used to address him as dear Meister. So he used to revere him so much. So the poem goes like this. Akash hote akash pote hajas rote jhorche jagod jhorna dharar moto Amar shorir mone adhir dhara shathe shathe boi chhe abhi rato. 
through the unlimited sky, universe is flowing like thousands of streams, dragging my entire self with them. Dui probaher ghate ghate utte che gan dine rate, shei gane gane amar prane jeu lege che koto, amar ridoi tate churno shegan chorae shoto shoto, oyakash doba dharad dolae duli obirote. These flows interwind together, creating heavenly tunes, makes me sway with them. In Ritto Pagol Bakulata Bisho Porane, Nitto Amai Jagira Keshanti Namani. This inherent dance in the heart of the world keeps me awake ever more. Chirodiner Kanna Hashi Utche Veshe Rashi Rashi. এসব দেখতে চেখন নিদ্রা হারা নয়ন অবনত ওগো সেই নয়নে নয়ন আমার হোক না নিমে শত ওই আকাশ ফরা দেখার সাথে দেখব অবিরত as the primitive joys and sorrows appear and disappear i know the timeless eyes watching them forever i pray that i have the vision of those eyes so resonating with this prayer of tagore I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Goswani. And once again, congratulations. And on behalf of uh, Professor Nana Poko, we want to wish you all the best. And um, we are so proud of you as a university to have to have academic um, of a uh, like you of that caliber, the law of gravitational and universality will always remain. And perhaps I should have asked all your students to say, do we need to modify general relativity? I don't have any answer and I'm not meant to answer it. But colleagues who are, who are watching and uh, the, the inaugural lecture of Professor Goswani, we want to thank you for making this event so fruitful and I'm of the few that you have learned a lot as a university and as a college uh, of agriculture and environmental sciences and engineering. Uh, we are of the view that uh, you have learned a lot today and we appreciate your presence of attending this inaugural lecture. Professor Kosani, once again, well done and congratulations. We wish you all the best. Thank you.